Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today we're asking, what would the world be like without animals? Well, for starters, there would be no Shark Week. (laughs) That's for sure. We're about to discover an Earth without animal life and find out how we can prevent animals from disappearing around the world. We're doing this episode in honor of the Kids Podcast Party. Us and a bunch of other kids podcasters are making episodes to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. Check out one of our favorite podcasts, Smash Boom Best, and their episode about capybaras versus Komodo dragons, which I I think I've got some ideas which is cooler, maybe. But anyway, now on to the show. (laughs) Today's question comes from Tumble listener Lena. My question is, what would the world be like without animals? That's a really good question, because, like, there's lots of planets that don't have any animals. All of them that we know of, really, except for this one. Yeah, so Lena has an idea of what our planet would be like without animals. It would be very empty, because humans are animals. That's right. I mean, there wouldn't even be anyone around to make podcasts. (laughs) That would be sad. Unless somehow rocks learn how to do it. (laughs) And they'll be like, this podcast rocks. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's ask our listeners what they think the world would be like without animals. And just to keep ourselves grounded in reality, let's add in this question. How do you think we can keep animals on the planet? Think about it, and we'll be back with a scientist who's working to stop animals from disappearing. To help answer Lena's question, I called up Ray Wynn Grant, an ecologist. I study large mammals like mountain lions and bears and even African lions, and I learn about how they use their environment. And I gather that information and look for patterns and trends and then use that to make sure that we're protecting these animals the way that they need to be protected. That's a, that's a pretty amazing job. <laughs> but I haven't even told you the coolest part, because Ray also gets to cuddle baby bear cubs. By far the best part of my job is cuddling bear cubs. There is nothing better than that. I bet lots of people would love to have a job that involves cuddling furry babies. (laughs) (laughs) Is she officially a cuddleologist? (laughs) Well, it's not her whole job, but Ray studies big animals with sharp teeth, including North American black bears. And so part of studying these bears is doing a checkup while they're hibernating and taking the babies out of the den away from their mom for like, five or ten minutes while the mama bear gets her checkup. Okay, so she's like the bear version of the toy table at the doctor's office. (laughs) Yeah. A couple of years ago, I saw a video of Ray cuddling two black bear cubs into her jacket, like two twin babies. We actually stuff the baby bears into our jackets to keep them warm because they've never experienced the cold before. They've always been cozy in a den, and we don't want them to start losing their body temperature. Okay, so it's not like she just has to cuddle them like little teddy bears. She has to. We're just holding them tight in our jackets, but it's for science. And Ray says science is actually the only reason to cuddle bear cubs. Don't do it at home, no. Only if you're a trained biologist. But let me tell you, being a trained biologist, it is the best reward. Science, adding to humanity's body of knowledge about the universe, and also giving people an excuse to cuddle cute animals. (laughs) Okay. But let's get to the real reason I wanted to talk to Ray, although I definitely wanted to talk to her about the bear cubs. Obviously. (laughs) I thought Ray would be great to answer Lena's question about a world without animals, because she's also a podcaster and TV presenter who travels the globe to talk about the importance of protecting animals. So what does she say the world would be like without animals? Well, Ray said Lena was on to something with her answer about humans being animals. Lena kind of took the words out of my mouth. The first thing I was going to respond with is that humans are animals too. 
And she says that would make knowing what the world would be like kind of difficult. So in one way, we don't know what the world would look like because we wouldn't even be there to see it. So to us, it would just look like nothing because we wouldn't see anything because we wouldn't be here. Yeah. And honestly, the world did look like that when we weren't around to see it. So let me say it this way, Lena. Since the planet Earth began, there have been periods where there were no animals. So it has happened before. Right. So there was a time before animals existed. Yeah. Animal life took a really long time to evolve on our planet. And when it did, Earth became home to many ecosystems. Food webs of animals and plants connected to environments that depend on each other. But there have been big periods of extinction when most of life disappeared. Like when the asteroid hit that killed all the dinosaurs. Exactly. So that's how Ray knows what would happen if animals disappeared now. I think if every animal disappeared just right away, all of a sudden, then we would have what we call a trophic cascade. What does a a trophic cascade mean? That's a pretty complicated phrase. It means that the food web would fall apart. Oh no, aren't we like hanging out on the food web? Do we want it to fall apart underneath us? We do not. So Ray gave an example of how a healthy food web should work starting with her favorite carnivores. Like maybe a grizzly bear to eat herbivores, like a deer. We need those herbivores to eat vegetation like grass. The effects of the food web continue or cascade down to countless other plant and animal species. We need the vegetation to grow, you know, a certain amount of roots, not too few, not too many to take care of the soil, and then if the soil's taken care of, then all of our waterways, all of our streams and rivers flow properly. So basically, if there weren't any bears, the water supply would get messed up? Exactly. So we would have a lot of problems if animals disappeared all of a sudden. A lot of things would kind of collapse. But if it was a slow process over millions and millions of years, something tells me the Earth might start looking like it did many millions of years ago. So like a gradual emptying out till it becomes like a hot, wet mess. Something like that. And ecologists like Ray are concerned about these trophic cascades because sometimes animals do disappear or go extinct. When we think about a world without animals these days, it's usually because humans have made so many changes to our environments that some animals really can't handle it. And one of the main ways that humans have changed things is by changing the land. Does she mean like changing the land by building houses and roads and other things that are just for humans that animals can't also have, like my cookies? Exactly. And we do need roads and houses. They're part of our built environment. But building has an effect on other animals' habitats. I think one easy way to think about it is with birds. Most birds need to build nests in trees. And when there's tons of forests just all over the place, they usually don't have a problem. But when we cut a highway through the forest or when we build a new neighborhood in a forest, that really changes how many trees are available for these birds. So less forest land means fewer trees. Makes sense. And fewer trees means fewer nests and fewer eggs. I think I can see where this is going. And so that means every year we have fewer and fewer of these birds, and eventually we might not have any. That's really too bad. I I like birds. Me too. So the good news is that people can step in and help save species before they're gone. We'll find out how after this quick break. We're back. So we've learned what the world looked like without animals and what might happen if animals now on the planet disappeared. Like ghosts in the night or like species whose habitats have been built over. Right. Ray gave the example of birds losing their trees. And to find out how to save a species, she mentioned a very special kind of bird. 
Bald eagles were once on the endangered species list. When I was a kid, they were endangered. And groups of people got together and made a plan for how to bring them back. And it worked. Yeah, for those of us who live in the United States, the bald eagle is like kind of a big deal. Yeah, it's kind of a big bird deal. It's a national symbol. It's like if the flag was an animal, <laughs> it would be <laughs> the bald eagle. <laughs> They're like very determined looking birds and they have dark brown feathers on their bodies, but white feathers on their heads, which gives them the look of being bald. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I saw lots of like videos of bald eagles and stuff, but I never saw one in real life. And now I see them like all the time. You're like, what majesty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There was one time one landed like right in front of my car as I was driving. What? I was just like, what? It was so big. They're so big. They're cool. They're enormous. They're, they look like they're person size, but they can't be. <laughs> <laughs> well, all those incredible experiences are thanks to something called the Endangered Species Act. So the Endangered Species Act is a piece of legislation that has really changed America for the better. A piece of legislation meaning that it's a law. Yes. So it's an American law meant to protect and save certain species that are endangered or in danger of going extinct. Each species that goes on the list gets a plan to help it recover back to normal populations. So it was first signed into law 50 years ago. And since then, so many, I mean, literally hundreds of animals have been listed on the endangered species list. So wait, I have a question. So my whole life, there's always been an endangered species list, but I don't think I've ever understood how an animal gets on it or off it. Yeah, it's not a list that an animal really wants to be on or even knows that it's on. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> but creating it takes a lot of data from scientists like Ray. Usually, we'll look at how many of this animal used to exist in a place and how many exist now. And there's not one specific number for all species. It depends on the species, it depends on the location, and it even depends on the biology of the species. Yeah, like how often they have babies or how many babies they have. That probably has a lot to do with how quickly a species can recover. Definitely. So it takes a lot of careful thinking and decision making to put an animal species on the endangered list and to create that plan. And one of the hardest parts is actually getting other humans on board. The Endangered Species Act isn't always everyone's favorite thing. But why not? Don't we all want to protect bald eagles? <laughs> and others? Well, it means that people have to change the way they interact with that animal's environment. Let's keep going with the bird example. Sometimes scientists and policymakers and community members will realize the only way to bring this bird back to a healthy population is to just leave its forest alone. And that means humans can't use the forest anymore. No hiking in there, no camping in there, no taking your dogs through there, no building through there, no making houses and homes and apartment buildings. Yeah, and I mean, I guess a lot of people want to move to forests. They're pretty. It's nice to live there. And there might already be people living there. And that can be tough for some people because what if that forest is in your backyard or what if the forest is in your yard? And all of a sudden the government says, hey, this is an endangered species that lives here in your backyard. So now you're not going to be able to make any changes because we're going to protect this animal. I can see how that would be really frustrating. Like if you want to build a shed or something to store all your tools or mow your lawn in a different way. Yeah, definitely. But like Lena said People are animals, too, and healthy ecosystems ultimately benefit all of us who live on the planet. So my hope is that for the next 50 years of the Endangered Species Act, we can work together better to find solutions that actually work for everybody, that work for people and that work for the animals we're trying to protect. And Ray says that's why she's passionate about studying animals. She collects valuable information to create good solutions for both people and animals. And I found that once I realized that I could use science right away to make change or to 
influence policy or to make a suggestion or a recommendation, I realized that was the right fit for me. That's really cool. Like, you know, a lot of times on our show, we've talked about scientists who study animals just because they're curious about how butts came to be or something like that, which is great. But, you know, you can also do science that really solves real problems out in the world. And I think that's great, too. So there's all kinds of ways that you can be a scientist or use your science, and they're all very useful. So in Ray's kind of being a scientist, you can solve real problems while just cuddling baby furry things. It's the best of both worlds. And speaking of possible worlds, I asked Ray what advice she'll have for Lena in imagining a world without animals. So, Lena, I would say that rather than imagining what the world would be like without animals, because at this point I don't think it would be a world that we want to see or live in, we can imagine what the world might be like that is better for animals. And that includes human animals, too. We human animals have to work to make that better world. I truly believe that every day we're getting there. We might not be able to see the changes day by day, but there's so many people who care and so many animals who care too. And science is helping us understand what's happening to animals and how we can help. We know what doesn't work. We know that pollution is bad. We know that climate change is creating harm. And there's so many of us out there who are working to make positive change. And that's the future that I want to envision. And I hope you will too. You can envision a positive future with Ray by creating your own plan to save animals. Think about an animal that you think might need saving. Maybe it's an animal that you used to see a lot in your neighborhood, but you're not seeing as often anymore. Or you could think about a favorite animal that you might already know a lot about. What do you think you might need to know in order to create a recovery plan? Think about what might be affecting the animal's habitat and what would need to change to provide animals with what they need to live and have babies. You can write down your plan or illustrate it with photos and pictures. If you do, we'd love to see it. Send it to us at tumblepodcast at gmail.com. Thanks today to Dr. Ray Wynn Grant, large carnivore ecologist and host of the PBS Nature podcast, Going Wild with Ray Wynn Grant. It's a podcast for adults. You can hear more from our interview with Ray on the bonus interview episode on our Patreon at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. And we have free resources to learn more about endangered species, including how you can look up animals on the endangered species list in every U.S. state. I did it and it was really interesting what I found. You can also find out what are the globally endangered species, all on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited the show and designed the episode art. Elliot Hijaj is our production assistant, and Gary Calhoun James engineered and mixed this episode. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery.